much. Um, really so grateful to be here today to present our uh, results in Laboratoire et Mécoton, especially in front of uh, a live audience for the first time in a long time. So thank you very much for that. Um, the work I'm going to present has been done uh, in our lab uh, and uh, with a great contribution of the uh, PhD student Kiluk Pham and the uh, assistant professor Stephen Lepoutre, but and with a, a valuable collaboration of uh, Tom Gallagher, who basically ended up uh, the ID to us over a platter. So thank you very much for that. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a certain way of applying a coherent light shift on divalent uh, Rydberg atoms. And uh, I added a subtitle, uh, Isolated Core Excitation Without Auto-Ionization. And I'm going to explain the keywords right away. Uh, so first, for people in the audience who would not be familiar with Rydberg atoms, it is atoms with uh, uh, one electron promoted to a very large principal quantum number, such that uh, the wave function of the electron has a, a very large size, and uh, this provides to these states very large transition dipoles, and therefore very large dipole-dipole interactions, and, uh, and uh, tremendously large uh, van der Waals interactions. And as a bonus, you also get uh, increasing radiative lifetimes, which give you the opportunity to uh, work with these states. Okay, um, so now more specifically on the valence atoms. Uh, so you have a second valence electron here. And uh, a long time ago already, there was this idea that uh, if indeed the Rydberg electron is so far from the core, uh, it should be possible to address the transitions of the core uh, ion uh, electron uh, optically as if uh, the ion was there standing alone. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, the, uh, the, the Rydberg electron is far from the core most of the time, but only most. And uh, from time to time, it's going to get close to the core and uh, because, well, two electrons interact quite strongly with Coulomb interactions, uh, there will be the opportunity for an energy exchange between the two. So now, a Rydberg electron is very close to the ionization limit. And so if the electron is able to catch some of the core energy, it's going to have enough energy to escape, to ionize. So we call that auto-ionization in the ID that uh, we provide the energy to one electron and then the system has enough energy on its own to ionize. Okay. So, um, now I can express a bit better the uh, motivations for this work, and uh, I'm not the first and certainly not the last uh, explaining that quantum simulation and quantum computing, uh, 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 you have high prospects with uh, Rydberg atoms and with alkali uh, Rydberg atoms, you have already uh, numerous uh, very promising results, uh, and I mean the list keeps growing almost every day, uh, but a lot of groups have turned to divalent atoms, and uh, one um, point, one interesting point, uh, and that the one I am interested in here today, is this idea of isolated core excitation that has been sketched in this uh, paper here, for instance. You could imagine using the same optical field here sketched in green, and to uh, apply an optical lattice, uh, and that would work both on the ground state of your uh, atom, uh, in this paper it is strontium, and uh, the same light would apply also a lattice on the Rydberg states of the same atom. Okay, so um, this is one of the uh, possibilities what you could do with isolated core excitation. I will uh, name now ICE. Um, and uh, the trouble is if you ever actually excite uh, the two electrons together, as I said, there is a risk for auto-ionization. So I'm using now a slightly uh, uh, cleaner uh, scheme to explain a bit better. So um, 
the first ID that you could do once you excited the, the first electron to a Rydberg state uh, is to shine light on resonance uh, with the ion core, and, uh, and you excite indeed this doubly excited state, but the, as I said, the interaction between the two electrons couples you to the continuum here with one uh, released electron and uh, the other electron coming back down to the ground state. Okay, and this happens so fast in a, a few picosecond time scales that uh, imaging or cooling a Rydberg atom is for now uh, not an option. But uh, if, you're, if you don't mind doing destructive detection, uh, then uh, it's still a valuable uh, detection method because, of course, uh, once, the ion, uh, w once the system was ionized, you still have the ion that still has this optical transition and you will cycle photons and image your uh, ions now. Uh, very efficiently. So that has been done in these uh, two papers uh, already. And uh, so what we wanted to do is to study uh, going to large orbital momentums because uh, uh, the centrifugal barrier should prevent the Rydberg electron to get close to the core. So you expect this autoionization to slow down significantly. And uh, so we've performed this study in, in this paper. And uh, I'm sad to say that we found that uh, ytterbium is uh, the worst species to do that. Uh, so allow me not to elaborate too much on, uh, on this disappointment, but uh, uh, it's still interesting to, to do the study. Of course, if you go all the way to circular states, it is going to work, whatever the species. And uh, this has been beautifully uh, demonstrated in LKB, and uh, I uh, invite you to look at these two papers for uh, more details on uh, circular state situations. So now, if you don't want to go all the way to circular states, want to use low orbital momentums, what else could you do? Well, you can detune uh, far from uh, resonance, and in principle, it should allow any state to, uh, to be uh, addressed again without autoionization, provided you go far enough, and it's exactly what was proposed in this paper that I presented uh, earlier. So now the trouble, uh, well, small trouble, but still, uh, is that it's still going to be the autoionization that uh, replaces spontaneous emission as the leading decoherence rate uh, induced by this light. Okay, so uh, because autoionization is uh, two or three orders of magnitude larger, you will have to go further away from resonance. It's a small trouble because you can go really far away and uh, there are some experiments already doing uh, this uh, at uh, 100 nanometer uh, detuning and, uh, and it's working pretty fine. But still, going further away from resonance means that uh, you will need more power and maybe you will get uh, into trouble either with photoionization of some intermediate states or couple the ground state to some other unwanted states and you have to be careful about this. Now I want to add a small complexity to this uh, scheme. The scheme was nice to picture what is going on but uh, in reality you have many many more states when you perform the uh, excitation to the Rydberg state, here you have a whole series of states. And when you apply your ICE beam, you also have a whole series of states up there. And so you can wonder, uh, will the autoionization actually display a structure uh, due to, to these different states? Okay, And uh, the answer is yes. And it was actually shown already uh, 1982, so uh, 40 years ago. Uh, and, uh, and you see, so every time you aim at one of the Rydberg states up there, you have an auto-ionization peak. So when uh, they started here on barium uh, uh, in from a 6S, 18S uh, state and exciting to the 6P, one half, every time you aim at a, a given Rydberg state up there, you have an auto-ionization peak. Okay, so you have this structure, which is quite uh, logical. Uh, what I'm more interested in is the local minimas here, 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 that appear, and uh, I will call them autoionization zeros from now on. 
and uh, we'll see why. So just to summarize what I've said so far, uh, because of these auto-ionization resonances, there is an unforeseen risk that uh, if you choose a certain detuning, even far from resonance, you might end up on one of those resonances and have uh, uh, one or two orders of magnitude more decoherence than what you would have expected assuming a Lorentzian from the main auto-ionization peak. So you have to be careful about this. It's not a big trouble. You can tune a bit the wavelength for, uh, for this uh, uh, trapping uh, and uh, it's going to work again. But there is also this new idea to use the auto-ionization zeros to get closer to resonance and so you will need less power, you will have less uh, photoionization or less other interactions in the uh, uh, system. So the main question is then, is there enough uh, reduction of the autoionization and is the light shift that you will be able to produce sufficient? So that's what we wanted to study. Now allow me one slide uh, of theory. Uh, it was uh, also uh, demonstrated uh, pretty early, uh, a few years after the, uh, the other results that I presented. Uh, and there is a, a beautiful theory called multi-channel quantum defect theory that manages to get an analytical formula for this uh, spectrum, auto-ionization spectrum. And uh, it lands uh, on uh, this formula. And the, the main idea here is that you have two parameters. The capital R here is the coupling between the two channels represented by the Rydberg series here and uh, the other channel being the continuum channel. So capital R is defining the coupling here, those red arrows. And you have another parameter, which is this delta prime, which is basically, so it's, it's called the, uh, the quantum defect. Actually, it's a quantum defect difference between uh, the, the, uh, so the difference of quantum defects between having a 6S core and a 6P core. The quantum defect is, uh, in essence, uh, linked to the phase acquired by the electron when scattering on the core. Okay, so um, in this formula, what is really interesting is this sinus cardinal function here that provides pure zeros in this spectrum. Okay, so. Uh, MQDT is, in a way, an approximation, but it is very valid and, uh, um, well, I will not elaborate too much on that, but we also could test uh, optical blur equations, uh, putting all those uh, lines, uh, laser lines, all the couplings, all the spontaneous emissions in there, and actually this figure here is from optical blur equation, while all the followings are MQDT, you will see they are basically equivalent. Okay, so it looks like we understand uh, the theory, but still we need to figure out what are these two parameters, R and delta prime, and the best for that is just to make the measurements and uh, get them out from uh, uh, fitting. So how do we do that? Uh, so I told you we have ytterbium atoms, uh, starting from the ground state uh, singlet S0, uh, and with a two photon excitation, we get to the Rydberg states here we chose the 6S NS singlet S0 as well up there. And uh, after obtaining the Rydberg states, we can shine the ICE light, and, uh, and so it will produce a certain number of ions. We apply a one microsecond pulse, and this ICE light here is uh, chosen large enough to address basically all atoms, okay? And uh, then you scan the frequency of this uh, ICE beam and obtain the spectrum. You see here in red the fit to the data. I'm hiding a few things in the, the, the carpet there, but uh, you have an additional peak here that uh, is not directly explained by MQDT, but still. So in the end, in the end you see that MQDT captures the physics very well. And, uh, and so from this we can get a certain uh, set of parameters, big R and delta prime, and uh, you can do that again for a different principal quantum number. This was n equals 60, you can do it for n equals 50. You get a different curve, uh, but you see that the, what you get is that the, the parameters R and delta prime uh, turn out to be the same within 
uh, an accuracy on the order of 10 to the minus 3. So you see that the, the model is very, uh, very stable. So now you see in, in e when expressing in uh, ICE frequency, the figures do, do not look the same, but uh, looking back at the formula, if you scale the cross-section sigma uh, by a new cube, uh, this is an effective principal quantum number, but it's basically n cube, uh, and uh, plot as a function of the uh, quantum number difference, uh, then all the lines should uh, fall back on a universal curve. And uh, indeed, you see that this is uh, what we get. So we, we can perform elaborate fits here, but uh, the take home message is that uh, on already with exactly this formula and fitting only with R and delta prime, you get already the, the physics pretty well. Okay, so now we have these uh, two parameters. We can go to, uh, to compute the light shift. And uh, the light shift, uh, you probably know that you can, uh, when you have the spectrum, uh, you can compute it from the Cauchy principal part integral uh, of your, uh, your um, cross-section. And this is exactly what we do. And so we can now predict for a given detuning the amount of light shift that we should get, okay? Uh, so to observe it, now what we will do is to apply the ICE beam simultaneously uh, with the Rydberg excitation beam and do a spectroscopic measurement of this shift. So in order to have a sizable enough shift, now we focus a bit more the ICE beam with a, a waste on the order of 100 micrometer. It's still pretty large, but it's, uh, it's good enough. And, uh, and so uh, we will get into different situations, but I will actually present uh, directly. So if you aim at a detuning uh, that is not on an uh, autoionization zero, this parameter is the uh, difference in quantum defects that I was talking about earlier, and it's not an integer, so it's not an autoionization zero, and so you will get a strong auto-ionization. Now, you create a Rydberg cloud that is much bigger, and only the atoms that were inside the ICE beam will be shifted and will be ionized. So all the other atoms will provide a signal line here that the, of atoms that will remain into the Rydberg state and provide a reference of unshifted atoms such that uh, the ion signal will provide the, uh, the measurement of the shift. I um, realize I didn't mention how we, uh, we measure these. Uh, it's pretty simple. When uh, we, you want to uh, take up the measurement, uh, you send a, a, an electric field ramp, and ions fly away directly to the detector, while Rydberg atoms require a certain field before ionizing, and so they arrive later on the detector, so you directly separate them in time, okay, so you can count. And, uh, and so this is what we do. We can distinguish uh, whether you had created ions or if the uh, atoms remained in the Rydberg state, and we directly see the shift in this tail here. So now we can uh, perform a rate equation model to uh, uh, taking into account uh, the uh, Rydberg excitation rate, the autoionization uh, rate, uh, the beam size, uh, for uh, all the different beams and uh, extract from that uh, the peak uh, light shift that uh, was provided at the center of the beam. And uh, uh, from that, we extract about 12 megahertz. I mean, th there's not much of a surprise. You see here that it's about, it, the, 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 sh the, the shoulder here goes about there. And uh, from the calculation, we expected about 10, which is in a reasonable agreement uh, when taking into account the experimental uncertainties. Okay, so that was on a, a red detuned uh, ICE beam, and you can do the same on a blue detuned uh, ICE beam. Again, uh, still not a zero, so you get Sorry, uh, you get the reference uh, line and you get the shifted uh, atoms that turn into iron. The ag uh, agreement is a bit less here, but we are closer to resonance and that could uh, lead to some trouble in the, uh, in the fitting procedure. Okay, so this is 
working pretty well, and now we can turn to uh, aiming at one auto ionization, zero, but of course we will not have this reference line anymore. Uh, so um, in this case, what we will do is uh, simply that we will alternate application or no application of the ICE beam, and uh, we will also uh, reduce the beam waste for the Rydberg excitation so that we again can shift most of the atoms, okay? And now when you do that, uh, you can uh, aim, for instance, first at the first uh, red zero, n equals 72 here, and uh, from the calculation, you expect about three megahertz shift, and this is about what we get. Now, uh, in black is the Rydberg line without IC beam, in red is the Rydberg line with, so you get the shift. Now you can look at the ions, and there is a small amount of uh, ion increase still, and uh, we attribute this uh, to not aiming perfectly on uh, the autoionization zero for this uh, case. Now, we can do the same experiment on uh, the first blue zero, and uh, here again you see the shift as uh, expected. Experiment is a bit more noisy here, but uh, the shift is still pretty visible. And uh, in this case, we aimed better at the autoionization zero. So you see there's no visible increase in the number of ions in the experiment. So we have a, a noise uh, threshold on the order of 0.5%, okay? So from, from this 0.5% and uh, the pulse time that is about six microseconds here, you can elaborate, uh, extrapolate a lifetime, uh, okay? And uh, uh, this lifetime is, sorry, on the order of uh, one millisecond, which is already much larger, about an order of magnitude larger than uh, the Rydberg lifetime. Okay, so auto-ionization is no longer the uh, limitation uh, in coherence time in this system. Okay, so that's, that's really the take-home message, and uh, it means it is going to be applicable uh, to uh, perform some operations, uh, okay? Now, uh, what is the real limit? Uh, I'm happy to discuss that uh, if uh, you're interested. I believe uh, it, they are not real zeros, but the limit should be pretty small. Um, finally, before going to the, uh, to the conclusion, uh, you again can uh, get a universal law by um, uh, normalizing the shift uh, in the right manner. And uh, this is what we did. So all the experiments that we performed uh, with the three different principal quantum number, uh, they, got, uh, they get quite nicely on uh, the same plot when uh, scaled correctly, okay? So uh, it shows that uh, we understand pretty well the, the physics of, uh, of this autoionization process. And uh, you, you see here these points and this point here are on the autoionization zeros. Now, um, about perspectives. Um, as soon as you say that you can apply this beam without uh, inducing additional losses, uh, you can think of uh, many things uh, to do with it. Um, and uh, I want to talk about heralding either success or failure, uh, for instance, in a joint uh, detection scheme. So imagine you are using uh, atoms and uh, for a certain operation, you are aiming at a given Rydberg state. You can add uh, an ICE beam on the corresponding autoionization zero. Okay, so you're basically doing nothing. Great. Well, not exactly nothing. If, for instance, this uh, state uh, gets shifted to another state by black body radiation, for instance, the operation that you wanted is destroyed. It's, it's going to be, uh, uh, it, it, it's going to fail. But uh, you have a hard time knowing that uh, it has changed, except that now with the uh, ICE beam, this other state will auto-ionize pretty fast. And so you will get a click on a detector only if it failed for this reason. So you can rule out all these points uh, very easily, okay? You can herald, in this case, failure. Uh, you can also use an ancilla atom that uh, gets to uh, the ionizing state only if the, uh, the two atoms here 
uh, were successful in an operation, then you herald uh, the, the, the success of uh, this operation. Okay, um, just two more slides. Uh, I, um, you can, of course, consider using it for trapping, either in optical tweezers or optical lattice. That was uh, the original ID. Okay, and, uh, and that way perhaps perform better quantum control over the, the qubit when exciting to the Rydberg state. And the last uh, ID is for local addressing. ICE light is intrinsically going to be short wavelength because it's the ion transition. It's usually shorter than uh, other transitions. And so you should be able to aim at uh, one site, shift it off resonance, for instance, and allowing a better connectivity throughout uh, an atomic array. Okay, so along this last ID, I have to mention uh, this experiment. So it is in uh, Jeff Thompson uh, team in Princeton, where they realized uh, this idea of shifting off resonance a uh, single qubit. Uh, so if you don't apply the IC light, uh, you get a Rabi oscillation towards uh, Rydberg excitation. And if you shine this light, the Rydberg state shifts off resonance and uh, you prevent the Rabi oscillation. So now, of course, you have, uh, if you aim at the tunings that are not on the autonization zero, uh, well, you get some losses. And when aiming right, you remove those losses, uh, at least over the, the time scale of, uh, of the experiment. Um, now, I want to emphasize one thing. We were using singlet S uh, zero states. They are using triplet S uh, one and it's uh, these zeros are still present and I want to make a statement any bosonic uh, divalent atom will uh, present those autoanalyzation zeros for all Rydberg states now for fermionic atoms uh, it's a more complex situation uh, in short uh, the trouble is that you have a nuclear spin so you have hyperfine states and it's uh, a bit more complicated to uh, sometimes some states will not display zeros, but I'm happy to discuss that as well if you're interested in applying this technique to fermions. Thank you for your attention. Uh, before asking question, I have a uh, 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 question to the audience, in particular to students. Please prepare your uh, questions because after Bill's que <laughs> question, we will ask also for student question. So please, Bill. <laughs> Right. Well, you told us that these zeros were um, interference related, and sure enough, mm -hmm. you know, their shape sort of reminds you of a Fano resonance. Mm -hmm. Can you show us what the interference channels are that lead to this? Um, yes. So, for instance, here, uh, so you aim, oh, okay, um, <laughs> you aim your laser somewhere here in between all those lines, and uh, you off-resonantly couple all those states, and you get some uh, coherent superposition of them that actually does not couple to the continuum anymore. That's, uh, that's one uh, picture. Uh, now, if I had two states, I'm, I'm pretty sure I could see where I should tune between them so mm -hmm. as to make the two things uh, cancel out. But when I got a gazillion, <laughs> well, okay, you know, maybe it's half a dozen, but mm -hmm. still, it's not obvious to me that mm -hmm. there's a place where everything cancels. So is that obvious? So uh, as long as everything is coherent up there, yes. And uh, it's the, the, the beauty of this uh, multi-channel quantum defect theory that uh, it provides a, a, an easy analytical formula uh -huh. that comes out. Uh, basically, this, uh, this uh, theory uh, turns the problem into a channel problem and uh, you end up with uh, um, an overlap integral between the initial uh, Rydberg wave function and the final Rydberg wave function and uh, which up there just depends on the energy you're aiming at and, uh, and so you have uh, two oscillatory functions, uh, the, uh, one changing with the aimed energy and so you have zeros happening uh, every now and then. Right, but then you warned us that sometimes the zeros aren't zeros. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because MQDT does not take into account ah. the core uh, radiative ah. decay, and I think that uh, gives a limit. But this limit uh, should be like uh, two or three orders of magnitude uh -huh. below the detectivity that we had in our experiment. So I think we're far from uh, seeing this limit. Yeah. Okay, I got lots of other questions, <laughs> but we need this. To yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure I have a good sense of the scales, but um, at some point, aren't you a little bit limited by the densities of like nearby atoms starting to create some light shift if they get excited and end up not being able to properly hit the middle ground for specific atoms because you have other atoms nearby that would get excited? Okay, so you're, you're talking about interaction in the system, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, well, the, the Basic idea, if I can go back to photoionization spectra in frequency here, look, this scale is in terahertz, so this here is about 50 gigahertz. Okay, so the, the, the autoionization zeros are actually uh, about 10 megahertz wide. Uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, if you are off by about 10 megahertz, it's not much of a big deal. And so you need more than 10 megahertz of interaction to start seeing the effect you were mentioning. Eventually you could if your atoms are very close and you would have to take it into account or actually use it. Uh, I don't know. But uh, it, you really need huge interactions to start uh, disturbing the, the process. Okay, there is a question from... Just a quick question. Can you elaborate on the perspective of creating magic trapping um, condition with ICE? If I understand correctly, in order to put a substantial additional light shift to compensate for differential polarizability, mm -hmm. you, you actually have to tune away from ICE, you know, auto-ionization resonance, meaning then you will have loss, right? Or am I missing something, you know, this particular... Mm -hmm. uh, Mm, I, I don't see why you would have to tune away from the zero. Uh, Is the so, light so shift to zero, um, getting, go, going through zero when you tune onto this uh, zero point of ICE and uh, autoionization resonance? So the, 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 the trick is uh, at one autoionization zero, you might not have a magic uh, condition. So you have to look uh, through the different uh, principal quantum numbers, uh, see if you can find close to magic conditions and it's not going to work for all states, but it might for some. Uh, another option would be to superpose a, a, a lattice that would work strongly on the ground state and, uh, uh, well, no, for lattices it's not going to work, but for optical tweezers, uh, you could have a, a first set of optical tweezers confining the ground state and another set of optical tweezers confining the Rydberg states because uh, quite naturally uh, this ICE beam is really off resonance from the, the ground state transitions and so you could separate the two functions and, uh, and use two different uh, uh, beams. So you could uh, in principle then adjust your laser power in the ICE beam to just get the same trapping frequency for instance. So, and, and still staying exactly at an auto-ionization zero. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, we have a question in the center, but first, uh, Vladan. So, I didn't quite understand why the radiative decay doesn't set a stronger limit. So, if I imagine that the Rydberg atom in the P state mm -hmm. is really an electron far away, and mm -hmm. I have an ion left that is now in the 6P state, mm -hmm. that state should decay in tens of nanoseconds. Why does that not happen? It, it does happen, and uh, that's why I'm saying that probably uh, the, the, the co uh, coherence time limit uh, on the autoionization zero becomes uh, the, the radiative decay, but the autoionization, if you're not sitting on a, a, a zero, goes in a few picoseconds, so it's much faster at the beginning. Okay, uh, unless you actually tune to the zeros. Basically, the, the, I mean, the, the, the transit time of the electron, even in the Rydberg state, is a few picoseconds, a few tens of picoseconds. So it's still going to be way faster. Basically, the, 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 the Coulomb interaction is so strong that when the electron comes close to the core, it immediately ionizes. I mean, it, it does not require like tens of uh, 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 
oscillations for the uh, electron. Just the first one, boom. So if I wanted to understand what the limit is, I could just estimate this by looking at the ion, driving the ion transition detuned, and then looking at the P, six peak side population in the ion to estimate how long the atom will live. If I yeah, yes, but you see, uh, the, um, when you are on uh, notoionization zero, you are already uh, about 10 gigahertz detuned also from the uh, radiative uh, uh, decay. So this is going to be small anyway. Hmm? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just oh, okay. We have the time for the last question over there. Yeah, so my question has to do with the prospect of um, uh, optically trapping ions and uh, possibly uh, doing uh, Rydberg imaging. So if you have one of those uh, alkaline earth atom trap in a tweezer and you use, um, you do photo-induced auto-ionization, is it safe to assume that the resulting ion is still trapped in, in this tweezer and that you could then uh, go on scattering photon off it or is just if, if you have a single ion, certainly, uh, it should be trappable and, uh, and will be. I mean, the, 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 you have clock, uh, ion clock working on this kind of uh, uh, procedure. Uh, and, uh, but if you have several ions in, in several traps, it's, uh, I mean, the Coulomb interaction between the ions will overcome uh, this trap depth, uh, okay, so they will fly away. So I, I would assume uh, the, the, the whole system to, to blow out uh, if you turn them all to ions, but if you make a quick uh, image, uh, quick enough, maybe you could get uh, an image, I, I don't know, you have to put the time scales of, of the Coulomb explosion and imaging time scale. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have to move on, but uh, yes. let's thank Patrick Th again. Thanks, you. <laughs>